Hey everybody! This will be one of a few videos that will look into some of the more interesting tinfoily fan theories that I have seen floating around for the lore of Dragon Age. The lore of Dragon Age is so complex, so let me know if you see if I miss anything or misinterpret anything. Also, please share any of your supporting arguments for or against the theory in the comments. These theories will contain spoilers for all games and books. You have been warned. This theory is one of the many theories about what really happened to lead to the fall of Arlathan. Now this will probably be a long one, so put on your tinfoil hat, sit back, and relax. Okay, so let's look at the ancient elven gods. We knew little about them from previous codexes, except that when they were trapped, Arlathan fell. That is, until Solus, Abelas, and the codexes in the Temple of Methal changed our whole perspective on things. We interestingly found out that Mithal was murdered, and not trapped like the other gods were. The Dread Wolf had nothing to do with her murder. Murder? I, I said nothing of... She was slain, if a god truly can be. Solas and Abelas did, after all, let us know that the gods warred among themselves. They were arrogant and fickle. They warred amongst themselves. They had feuds, vendettas. And you are bound to one of them now. The Shemlin did not destroy Alafan. We Elven warred upon ourselves. By the time the doors to this sanctuary closed, our time was over. Now initially, my first reaction was that it must have been Elgernon who had betrayed and murdered Mithal, if only because of the parallels between she and Flemeth, and even Andraste, whose husbands betrayed them. It says long ago you left your husband for a lover. Your husband then tricked you, killed your lover, and imprisoned you. Then a spirit came to offer you vengeance. Mithal, that's what you spoke of. One day someone will summarize the terrible events of your life so quickly. Because things happened that were never meant to happen. She was betrayed as I was betrayed, as the world was betrayed. But now I'm starting to wonder if there weren't other gods involved with her murder. In exploring the temple, there is specific dialogue with Morrigan and Solus if you bring him, about three specific gods, Fenharel, Falandin, and Andruil. Now, we know Fenharel turned out to be a majorly important god to the narrative, so what does that tell us about Falandin and Andruil? What we did learn about them is that they both appeared to have a history of issues with Mithal. I'm sure you must see where I'm going with this. Our keeper taught them the prayers. I do not believe they sing songs about Falun Din's vanity. Go ahead. You must have a legend for us. It is said Falun Din's appetite for adulation was so great, he began wars to amass more worshippers. The blood of those who wouldn't bow low filled the lakes as wide as oceans. Mithal rallied the gods once the shadow of Falandin's hunger stretched across her own people. It was almost too late. Falandin only surrendered when his brethren bloodied him in his own temple. No story is dramatic if the people in it act sensibly. Yes. Most tales paint Falandin's stubbornness second only to his self-regard. The Codex says, one day, Andruil grew tired of hunting mortal men and beasts. She began stalking the Forgotten Ones, wicked things that thrive in the Abyss. Yet even a god should not linger there, and each time she entered the Void, Andruil suffered longer and longer periods of madness after returning. Andruil put on armor made of the Void, and all but forgot her true face. She made weapons of darkness, and plague ate her lands. She howled things meant to be forgotten, and the other gods became fearful Andruil would hunt them in turn. So Mithal spread rumors of a monstrous creature and took the form of a great serpent, waiting for Andruil at the base of a mountain. When Andruil came, Mithal sprang on the hunter. They fought for three days and nights, Andruil slashing deep gouges in the serpent's hide, but Mithal's magic sapped Andruil's strength and stole her knowledge of how to find the void. After this, the Great Hunter could never make her way back to the Abyss, and peace returned. Now we also find out that because Elgernon's vengeance tended to be a little… intense, Mithal was normally the one who delivered and carried out the more rational and cool-headed judgment. 
Whenever one of the people wronged another, they would not call on Elgernon to avenge them, for his fury would destroy all it touched. Mithal saw this bring strife among the people, and went to Elgernon. She offered to deliver justice when the people warred amongst themselves. Elgernon saw her wisdom and agreed, binding all to abide by her verdicts. As an example of her judgment, let's backtrack a little and think about that Codex of Andrul's. It talks about Mithal having to basically put Andrul down. She had been going into the void to hunt forgotten ones, and returning with more and more madness. Once, she even returned with armor made from the void, and created weapons out of it. First off, I think it takes a pretty screwed up person to go hunting men and other possible gods, and we've also heard of her being a questionable rapist in the Masked Empire, so it's not that big of a surprise. But, I think the most interesting part about this is the talk of the Void, whatever that is. She turned insane, not even knowing herself. Could this be talking of Red Lyrium corruption or the Blight? Cause that's sure what it sounds like to me. Solus told us first, at the very beginning of the game, that Red Lyrium is corrupted Lyrium. Magic could have drawn on Lyrium beneath the temple, corrupted it. <laughs> it's evil. Whatever you do, don't touch it. And then, that dirtbag, Bianca, told us what the implications are for that. I found out that Red Lyrium... It has the Blight, Varric. Do you know what that means? What? The two deadly things combined to form something super awful? Lyrium is alive. Or something like it. Blight doesn't infect minerals, only animals. It means Lyrium is somehow alive, though I doubt it's sentient. So, that means that Red Lyrium involves Blight Magic, something we already know to be highly contagious, dangerous, deadly, and still super duper mysterious. Now, if you've seen my videos on elven murals, I theorized that the ones that depicted war were all lined in red, which reminded me of Red Lyrium corruption. That's what's making me think that this war between elves had something to do with Red Lyrium. Did Andruil bring it from the void and cause it to spread? The Codex says that the plague ate her lands. Did the elven gods try to use blight magic as weapons in their wars against each other? And okay, I know this might be a long shot, but there's these two pieces of banter between Solus and Vivian that have always stuck out to me. Corypheus is a complex creature to draw upon so many different sources of power. He has his own magic, he draws from the blight, the artifact he carries is elven, and now he uses a demon to create a false calling to fool the mages. The false calling was blight magic. The demon merely amplified its power. This ancient magister is like a man drinking from three wine glasses at once. And one of the glasses is poisoned. You disapprove of Corypheus using the magic of the blight service? Every intelligent creature should. Yet you raise no objection to the Grey Wardens using blood magic. Blood magic is no worse than any other properly used, but the Blight, the Blight corrupts everything it touches. Those who believe themselves capable of using it safely are mad. While he may simply be talking about the Red Templars that they're currently fighting, something in the way he phrases it and the tone of his voice tells me that he's speaking from experience. If this were the case, it's likely that the Blight or corruption would spread fast and hard, especially among the slaves the gods would have used to fight their battles. Is that what all of these murals represent? A war with corrupted elves serving the gods? Another aspect that interests me about the Andril Codex is the part that says, Mithal's magic sapped Andril's strength and stole her knowledge of how to find the void. After this, the Great Hunter could never make her way back to the Abyss, and peace returned. So how could Mithal steal Andril's knowledge of the void and prevent her from ever returning? This reminds me strongly of the Rite of Tranquility, cutting off mages from the Fade. Did Mithal somehow make Andril tranquil? If we look at her mosaic, the tiles are arranged in a circular pattern on her forehead, very reminiscent of the tranquil brand that we have seen in Dragon Age 2. So we know that both Andril and Felon Din had these run-ins with Mithal. Did any of the other gods as well? One of my favorite codexes comes to mind. In the Temple of Mithal, there's a codex that you can pick up using the Veilfire to reveal it. It's called Ancient Elven Writings, and it shows up in the fifth spot in the history section of the codex in Dragon Age Inquisition. 
If your Inquisitor does not drink from the well, this codex will remain untranslatable. However, if you do partake of the well, it gives a new, very enlightening message. There are whispers from the Well of Sorrows. It's impossible to understand the entire text, but certain parts suddenly reveal a shadow of their original meaning. His crime is high treason. He took on a form reserved for the gods and their chosen, and dared to fly in the shape of the divine. The sinner belongs to Durthamen. He claims he took wings at the urging of Gilanane, and begs protection from Mithal. She does not show him favor, and will let Elgarnon judge him. For one moment, there is an image of a shifting, shadowy mass with blazing eyes, whose form may be one or many. Then it fades. Okay, so this is really mysterious. Who is this sinner that the Codex is talking about? He belongs to Durthamen, the god of secrets. Does this mean that he was one of his servants? Or maybe a lover? But apparently, this sinner took on the form of a winged beast that only gods and their chosen are meant to take. The first thing that comes to my mind is a dragon. Mithal can take the form of a dragon, so does that mean that other gods were able to as well? So, this sinner was not supposed to take this form because it was reserved only for the gods and their chosen, but he was somehow able to, at the urging of Gilanane, the Hala Mother. The interesting thing about this codex is that both Durthamen and Gilanane are associated with Falundin and Andril, respectively. Durthamen and Falundin were reportedly, as according to codexes, inseparable, twins, or one another's reflections, and maybe even lovers. And I was always under the impression that Andruil and Gilanane were lovers, but that's never really explicitly stated. At the very least, it is clear that she was Andruil's chosen and was thus ascended to godhood. This reminds me of another of the murals I mentioned in my Elven Murals video. At the back of the stable in Skyhold, as well as in Callanhead's foothold, there's a painting of a bear clutching a white, antlered figure. Durthamin's animal symbol is that of a bear, and is his most favorite animal. And Gilanane, the Hala Mother, is associated with a Hala, which is pure white, antlered, and similar to the figure in the painting. Were Durthamin and Gilanane conspiring together? Perhaps to exact revenge for Mithal's judgment against their favored partners? Or maybe all four were working together. And this sinner, who was it? Was it one of the old gods? What were Durthamen and Gilanane doing, working with this sinner? Was the sinner a willing participant? Was the sinner tricked into doing their bidding? It says that this sinner wanted protection from Mithal, who then denied it. So I'm not really sure about the timeline, but I'm picturing a sort of civil war going on between the elven gods and the people corruption spreading throughout them all. And, as we learned, Mithal at some point ended up being murdered. If you've seen my video series analyzing the motivations of Fen'Harel, I theorize that he locked the gods away in order to protect the common elves of Arlathan. I think that Mithal's murder must be what finally tipped him over the edge, causing him to take this drastic action. Though I do get the impression that he's currently somewhat angry or disappointed with her for not taking more steps to help the people for the many years she's been living through Flemeth, it's clear through their exchange in the epilogue that there is a long history of love and affection there. They need me. I am so sorry. I am sorry as well, old friend. So, when she died, is that what made Fen'Harel do the thing that he is so vilified for? Locking the gods away? But how? According to the World of Thetis, Volume 1, the elves believe that the creators are trapped in the Black City, or what they call the Eternal City. If you have heard of or seen my video presenting the theory that the Black City is Arlathan, I mentioned that the Black City is theorized to be a corrupted version of Arlathan that has been physically moved and locked in the Fade, with the Veil having been created to separate it from the physical world. Well, who do we know who had the power to open holes in the Veil? Solus's orb, or Fen'Harel's orb more accurately, is one of the very, very few methods that we have heard of that has allowed people to enter the Fade physically. 
If he was looking to protect the slaves and the common elves caught in the crossfire between powerful, corrupted, warring gods who were spreading corruption and the blight, and murdered the mother-like figure of all the gods, I would imagine he would take some pretty drastic measures, at all costs, and we have seen that he's not afraid to do that. Solus has implied that in the times of ancient Arlathan, the veil did not exist, and spirits and magic flowed freely among everything. I'd like to know more about the veil. Circle mages call it a barrier between this world and the Fae, but according to my studies in ancient elven lore, that is a vast oversimplification. Without it, imagine if spirits entered freely. The Fae was not a place one went, but a state of nature like the wind. It sounds like it would be wonderful. And dangerous. But yes, a world where imagination defines reality, where spirits are as common as trees or grass. Instead, spirits are strange and fearful, and the Fade is a terrifying world touched only by mages and dreamers. I am glad that I'm not alone in seeing the beauty of such a world, along with the obvious peril. So how was the Veil created? Why was it created? We have been given hints that the Veil is a construct and not a natural part of the world. So how and why was it constructed? Again, I think you probably know where I'm going with this, but I have a few tangential theories that go off the wall a little bit here. We have hints that the Veil was created at Skyhold. In Elven, it is known as Terras Lan Telas, or the place where the sky was held back. Was held back, not is being held back. It sounds like one event took place that held the sky back. Could this be talking about the Fade? The magic and spirits that used to roam the world freely? The codex that we get when arriving at Skyhold mentions that the veil is old there. Perhaps because that's where it was first constructed. If Fenharel's orb is one of the few devices we know that has any power over the veil, one can assume that he must have had at least a hand in creating it. So did he, fed up with the other gods' fickle fighting, that was spreading corruption among the people, decide to lock them away behind the veil. If we go with the theory that the Black City is Arlathan, located physically within the Fade, is that where he trapped them? Or, as Cole indicates, they may be trapped in a mirror. An Alluvion? They sleep, masked in a mirror, hiding, hurting, and to wake them... Where did it go? I apologize, Cole. That is not a pain you can heal. I'm sorry. It was my doing, not yours. So, here's where we get really tinfoily, but let's assume all the theories are true. Could Fenharel have trapped the Elven Gods behind an Alluvion, whose only exit is in the Black City, which is corrupted by the Blight from the wars between the Gods, and can only be accessed by the physically entering the Fade through the Veil that was constructed to sort of quarantine them off? Sorry, I got kind of excited there. Is this why the mark is so often referred to as a key? To me, it says key. But keys do a lot of things. Open, lock, switch. Some open one thing, some open everything. It sounds like Corypheus made it to open. But it looks like you can use it to close. It may be that simple. It sure is pretty. Wish I could see through it. It seems you hold the key to our salvation. Is this why the Black City was already corrupt when the Magisters arrived? I once breached the Fade in the name of another to serve the old gods of the Empire in person. I found only chaos and corruption, dead whispers. For a thousand years I was confused, no more. Is this the corrupted city Tamlin saw in the Alluvion in the Dalish origin of Dragon Age Origins? Can you feel that? I think it knows we're here. I just need to take a closer look. It's showing me places. I can see some kind of city underground. And there's a great blackness. It saw me. Help! I can't look away! Meryl was working on that same Alluvion for years, and a similar Alluvion is hiding in a corner in the library of the Winter Palace. What's it doing there? Is this why the Dread Wolf went into a long slumber? I would imagine it would take an extreme amount of power to move a city, 
and construct a sort of barrier between it, the dreamlike world of the Fade from the physical realm. I was too weak to unlock it after my slumber. Is this why the ancient elves took refuge in Kadash Taik? Some were saved, carried by fugitives from the elven city. Their sorrow awoke the stone, and her children sheltered them. They found a sanctuary in the deep halls of Kad Halash, now known as Kadash. There the lights of Arlathan lie, shielded from unworthy eyes. Is this why the translated elven text in the Codex on Skyhold speaks of threatened victory, promised freedom, untorn veils, and apologies? It says, Our belief transformed into everything. All time is transformed into the final slash first death. Inevitable slash threatened victory and horrible slash promised freedom in the untorn veils, where the sky is held up slash back, where the people give slash gain love, that is an apology slash promise from slash to blank. Is this why it was so easy for Tevinter to break the Empire of Elves, already weakened by corruption, civil war, and uprising? Is this why Solus has so many regrets, thinking he made a mistake and thinking that the people need him? You didn't do it to be right. You did it to save them. Solus, what is Cole talking about? A mistake. One of many made by a much younger elf who was certain he knew everything. You weren't wrong, though. Thank you, Cole. The failure was mine. I should pay the price. But the people... They need me. I am so sorry. So, to make a really long story short, the theory is that the elven gods Andril, Falandin, Dirthamin, and Gilanane, and perhaps others as well for all we know, conspired against Mithal, bringing the Blight and or Red Lyrium corruption to the elven people, and civil war broke out among them. In this mess, Mithal was murdered, thus making Fenharel snap, forcing him to take action against the gods, trapping them away behind an alluvion whose only entrance is located within the now corrupted Black City, and moved that city into the Fade physically trapping it behind the veil where it couldn't be reached except by a key. The power of his orb, perhaps? And we all know who has that power now. And I think it's safe to assume that he'll probably be needing it. And now that Solus has seen what damage this has done to the people, he has yet another impulsive plan to look where things went wrong and try again. I'll take a breath, see where things went wrong, and then try again. Just like that. If we don't keep trying, we'll never get it right. You're right. Thank you. I know this theory is probably one of the most tinfoily ones that I have presented so far, basing one unproven theory upon another unproven theory upon another. So for all I know, I could be totally off. But I've been trying to organize these thoughts into one coherent theory for a while, so I really apologize if it was rambling or if it didn't make any sense. Let me know your thoughts. Or if you have any questions to clarify what my crazy ass means. Or if you have any comments. I really hope you enjoyed. Thanks!